Okay, I think probably it's it's a little bit past noon, so we should probably get started. So uh, thank you everybody for joining me and uh, and Evan Elford, as you know, we do this, uh, we started this regular on happenings every couple of months starting last growing season and we decided for the winter to expand this to invite some guest speakers so you could hear about some research that's going on in other areas. Uh, so uh, we had a, a really interesting talk uh, last December um, about um, hop variety development in the Maritimes. And so we're gonna switch gears this year and uh, this, uh, this one and talk a little bit about um, hops viruses. Uh, so uh, my name is Melanie Philitas. For those of you who don't know me, I co-host this with Evan Elford, who is not on right now because he is having technical difficulties. So he will hopefully be joining us shortly. Um, so I'm just gonna do a little bit of uh, business before we uh, I turn it over to our speaker. So just uh, for those of you who know, we are, would like to know we are recording this webinar so that we can post it to the blog for those people who are not uh, able to attend. So uh, if you do not want your uh, face on this view uh, webinar, turn your video off because otherwise you will be displayed on my screen as I uh, record it. Um, and so uh, Dr. Malmstrom uh, will be uh, giving us a presentation on hops viruses and she encourages questions throughout, but we're going to ask that you feed those through the chat. So I'll be monitoring the chat if you have a question as she's going or if she uh, she might be asking us some questions. Uh, so any feedback, just please feed that through the chat itself and I will uh, jump in and feed those questions to Carolyn. Um, if you want to actually uh, verbally ask her a question, there will be time to do that at the end, but just during the presentation, um, feed it through the chat. Uh, so with that, I will uh, just introduce our speaker. So uh, Dr. Carolyn Malmstrom is an Associate Professor of Plant Biology from Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. And uh, her research focuses generally on understanding uh, how viruses, virids, and phytoplasmas move among agricultural and natural communities and influence ecological dynamics. Um, and I think, Carolyn, you work on a number of crop systems, but uh, you, that includes hops. And so um, we have done some uh, virus surveys here in Ontario, found some high levels of virus. So we've had some, some chats ourselves about viruses. Um, I have actually sent Carolyn uh, some of my slides that I've presented to, uh, to the Ontario growers. So I think she's going to mention some of that when she gives her talk. Uh, but we wanted to hear about uh, what they were doing in Michigan, because I think um, she's been sort of really rolling with the virus work that, uh, or the virus situation they have down there. So with that, I am going to stop my sharing. Uh, and Carolyn, I think I have everybody muted, so you're going to have to unmute yourself and share your screen. <laughs> so. Here we go. How's my sound? Good for me. You can hear? Well, yep. thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope you guys are having less icy weather than we are here. It's, it's in full glop mode for us a bit. So it's a great time to be thinking about the summer season when things are a little bit shinier for all of us. And um, I would like to update you on what we've been doing with hop, but more than that, I want to talk sort of contextually about where we are really broadly about thinking about viruses and their interactions with crops, particularly high value perennial crops like hops. So I'm not going to be able to solve all of your virus problems today as much as I would like to, but I would like to give you some bigger context for thinking about them and where we're going with these class of questions because growing a crop like hop is a, is a long game. And so it's important to know where that long game is going. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the science uh, approaches we take to do things and some thoughts about where the questions are, where we need to go next. And I really look forward to any of your uh, questions or anything else you wanna talk about. To start off thanking a bunch of people here at MSU and elsewhere have been critical for us in working with this really interesting crop. And I'm going to start off by reminding all of us uh, what some of these common viruses and viroids in hop are. So many of you are familiar with them, but it's always nice, even for us, when we work in different crops, to remind ourselves of which of these guys we're looking at when. And so one of the big groups that's important in our um, hop environment are the ones that are called carloviruses. And these are in the family beta flexibility. So they're these very long, thin pieces. You could see here. It's made of a lot of little 
proteins make this long tube and then inside the tube is the genomic RNA. So all of us are a lot more familiar with viruses now after having been locked down in pandemic for some time period. Um, we've been kind of focused on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and there's quite a plethora of other viruses out there in the world, including the ones that are in our, in our hops. So what's really interesting about the Carla viruses is there's at least three flavors of them that infect hops, three species here, hop mosaic virus, hop latent virus, and American hop latent virus. And they are transmitted both mechanically by say by shears or mowing, as well as by aphids. And so here I want to, sh I'm showing you, I'm, ah, sorry, I'm having a little thing with my pointer. I'm showing you uh, what we call a cladogram. So it shows the family relationship between different types of carloviruses. And I'm wondering, can you guys tell me, is my, is my Zoom um, box on top of the figure or can you see the figure okay? Uh, I can see it fine. Okay, awesome. I can't, but that's great. I happen to know what's on it. So uh, it's very interesting for us to think about how viruses are related to each other. That's what part of the work that happened with the COVID virus is people trying to understand where did this virus come from, what's related to. And so what you can see here up at the top in red are the, the relationships between hop latent virus and hop mosaic virus. So they're quite closely related to each other, sharing those bars. And then the American hop latent virus is more distinct. So in order to get from these viruses to American hot virus, we'd have to go all the way down here and over to this one. So it has branched off at an earlier time and is more, more different. So we know we have these, these diversity in the carloviruses in our hops, and it means that they can do interesting things when they're in there together. Viruses make different proteins that have impacts on the host. And when you have multiple viruses, in a plant, those proteins can complement each other. And so the viruses as a group may do more than if just one of them was alone. So here are some of the um, aphids in our general area that can transmit carloviruses. So the Dansom hop aphid is a prime candidate of this. this, is an exotic aphid that was introduced here from Europe and it causes issues on hop on its own, but also can transmit all three of the carloviruses. In addition, potato aphids can transmit the hop latent virus and the hop mosaic virus. And then the green peach aphids, Mises persica, if you work in greenhouses very much, you know these are quite a challenge and they um, often become pesticide resistant. They transmit many different viruses, but they again transmit the hop latent virus and the hop mosaic virus. It's possible they also transmit the American hop latent virus, but that one is less understood. So we haven't, we haven't completely sorted that one out. So when we're thinking about how we're managing and controlling carloviruses, we have two things to keep an eye on. One is how we're cutting our plants and whether or not we're accidentally moving sap from one plant to another with a knife, with a weed whacker, with a mower. And the other is whether or not there are aphids in the area who could be moving viruses from plant to plant as well. The two viruses, carloviruses with the word latent in their names, that indicates that they don't tend to cause dramatic symptoms on the plant. A hot mosaic virus has the word mosaic in it because on some sensitive uh, cultivars, particularly golden type ones, you can see patterning like this. But the general take home for us is that with all virus infections, we can't rely on symptoms in the leaves. If we do see symptoms that are distinct, generally we do have the infection, but the converse isn't true we can have infection without anything being really obvious to us. And the other big player in our hop systems here is an Iller virus, an apple mosaic virus. And this one used to be called Prunus necrotic ring spot virus. So you may still see that acronym sometimes and it's related uh, to it, but now it has its own name of an uh, apple mosaic virus. The best of our knowledge, this one is just mechanically transmitted and it's pretty cool because it's very on here. So this is how the virus is packaged up with a, this protein coat. And instead of being a long tube like the carlovirus is, it's this um, icosahedral shape and the genomic material is inside. But what's kind of cool about this one is that there's three different particle types and to have an infection, you, uh, the plant has to acquire all three of the types, they work together. Apple mosaic virus, as you may be aware, causes more um, distinct 
patterns on leaves can be let's do this ring type pattern, for example, or more of a of an oak leaf pattern like this. But it can also cause an infection without any symptoms. There are other possible concerns. We've been looking in our area, for example, a lot for um, Arabis mosaic virus, which is vectored by nematodes. We haven't yet found it, but we keep screaming. And then there's some possibility of other infections, uh, say with alfalfa mosaic virus or novel viruses that we've been hunting for to see if any of them might be of concern. So viruses are protein coats inside which there's a nucleic acid, generally in our case, RNA, and that RNA can generate proteins just the way the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, when they insert mRNA into us, will stimulate us to make the spike proteins or antibodies can attack it. There's another type of nanomicrobe that's even smaller than a virus, and that's a viroid. And what's really interesting about them is they're really small. So where a, a virus might have a genome that's like 8,000 uh, nucleotides in length, a hot stunt viroid or a hop latent viroid, for example, may just be 200 to 300. And they form this little ring like this that anneals on itself, makes kind of a hairpin turn. And it does not code for any proteins. So where a virus stimulates a plant to make proteins for itself, uh, this does not directly code for proteins and it can have a really big impact on plants. So that's a, a real area of exploration in the field, trying to understand how do viroids have the effects that they do. But we can see them as being quite dramatic. Um, for example, here you can see this decline. Um, I'm going to my arrow. So we can see this loss of vigor really evident here with a hop stunt viroid infection. And hop stunt viroid can sometimes cause patterning in leaves like this as well. Hop latent viroid, which we have some here, and I know that uh, you folks weren't able to test for it in the most recent survey in your direction, but it also can cause some uh, quality reduction in hop. And it has been showing up actually in some of the cannabis growing. Uh, I, I find this kind of amusing. Here is a healthy cannabis plant and one infected with this viroid. In the US, we are not allowed to work with a cannabis that produces THC because we're federally funded, so we can't contribute to this. So this has contributed to um, other other folks outside of the universities trying to identify what the pathogenic agents are, and they're ones that we actually already know from hop because the two are in the same family. So the practical question for all of us is how do we determine what infections might be in our hop? And that comes down to this question of diagnostics, which again, with COVID, we probably have all been hearing about way more than um, we would wish to be thinking about this. So with hops, one of the critical questions all the way through is how do we get the plant material into a form where we could actually test for a virus or a viroid here? And it matters quite a lot what type of tissue you take, when you take it, how you handle it, and then what kind of process you use to take the, the RNA or virus particles out of that tissue. So for example, when I spoke with you guys last, I showed you that we were using these type of approach here with a, a bead beater where we put samples in tubes like this with beads and this is a special chemicals to extract it and it gets homogenized and then we can perform some more chemical steps to get the RNA component of this out. And when I showed you that work, we were looking at, for example, testing leaves and we showed here, this is how much we homogenize the tissue in terms of minutes. And one point that was really loudly evident to us was if we work with samples from the greenhouse, it's really easy for us to detect any of these uh, um, viruses here. But the field grown samples is much harder to get positives out of. So. If you want to take a look over here, you can see here is what a sample looks like coming from our greenhouse. You can see how happy these leaves look. Here is an example of a sample that we might have coming from the field by the time it gets to us. So it may have been um, not in prime condition when it went into the bag and then it's had the challenge of being shipped here as well. 
So that's one thing that's under our control when we're sampling ourselves is think about, are we getting samples that are in as good condition as possible? So there's the greatest chance of being able to detect uh, a virus in them. Right now, we still favor um, looking at virus content in petioles. And folks also sometimes look at it in the midribs components of leaves as well. So it's good to make sure that you have enough sample in there with some good petiole material. And it's nice if the leaf is good quality too. So the tissue type, the developmental stage, even something like pesticide residue are gonna make a difference. So if this leaf is covered with a sticker spreader from a recent pesticide application, that can pose some challenges downstream for analysis. So something to think about. If you had a choice to, to sample uh, leaves and petals before you spray it or right after, I would always pick the before. And so let's just think a little bit about the different types of diagnostic approaches out there. Many of you are familiar with them, but it's an area of um, continued focus for any work with viruses. And so I find it helpful to think about the broad types of approaches that we can use out there. So one, one approach is that we use antibodies to identify a viral protein. And that's a, a approach called ELISA. That is what's being used for the, some of the most inexpensive methods for detecting COVID-2, for example. So in this case, we're looking for an antibody which can match up with a protein and identify as belonging to the target virus. This is sometimes called a serological approach because we look for, for um, proteins in human blood in the medical world, even though in plants we don't have exactly the same thing, we still call it a serological approach. So it is the easiest type of diagnostic approach to do in terms of the skills required in the lab, and it's typically among the less expensive, but it is always less sensitive, and it depends on having good antibodies to be able to identify the thing that you're looking for. And it won't work for viroids. We talked about viroids don't make proteins, so you can't have an antibody to something where there's no protein. It has to have a protein to match. In addition, if we wanted to do any kind of sequencing to understand more specifically about the nature of the virus we found, we would have to do another type of analysis. So LISA won't give us that. So the majority of diagnostic tests right now that are required to be sensitive use a different approach where we take small pieces of the target genetic code, which we call primers, and we use them to look for matches. And these processes are called things like RT-PCR, qPCR, and LAMP sometimes is used in the field. So when you submit samples for diagnosis to different labs, typically the lab is running some type of RT-PCR or qPCR approach. But you should always ask, because if, if the approach used instead was an ELISA, you'll want to make sure that the sensitivity was appropriate for your size of your sample too. So if we use this approach of looking for matches in the genetic code, that's a molecular diagnostics approach. And it's typically the most sensitive and can permit us to sequence the viruses so we can tell uh, more about their identity and where they might have come. But this approach is definitely more expensive and it requires more care in the lab. The LAMP method is the easiest of them all. But we have to have uh, lab technicians who are pretty skilled to do this. And you also need to know the sequence of your target. So we've been working to develop some good assays for detecting uh, critical hot viruses, and we're using an RT-PCR type approach here because of the sensitivity. And the third broad approach that people are using these days is the approach that's been made possible by the development in new sequencing technologies. And this approach, basically, you take your genomic uh, material of the plant and the virus together, you cut up in little pieces, you sequence all the little pieces, and then you put them together again using bioinformatics computational power to see what you have. And these approaches are referred to as deep sequencing or next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing. And this, these approaches are very sensitive and powerful. 
and they allow us to detect nearly everything in a sample, whether or not we know it's there. So it's a great non-biased way of looking for things. However, it's costly and it requires special expertise. So we tend to use it primarily for bulk samples for research. It's not so good for one sample at a time, but you might put tens to hundreds together and take a look what was in them. Because of the focus on SARS-CoV-2, there's been a great investment in medical approaches for diagnosing viruses. And this is ultimately going to be to our benefit in the study of pathology in plants as well, because the medical world has so much more money that is invested in uh, agricultural and plant pathology for this type of, of um, system development. And so it's really to our benefit to piggyback off of any type of technology that the medical world is developing. And one example of this is that there is a type of system that bacteria have developed as a defense system against viruses. Ah, I should say against there. Uh, and one of them is referred to as CRISPR-Cas13. This system can actually interact with RNA and edit it. So the CRISPR systems have been explored for gene editing and perhaps you've heard about that in, in previous talks. What's relevant here is some labs that are doing work with this CRISPR system are now using it as the basis of a diagnostic for COVID-19 point of care tests. And this approach ultimately will require much less lab work and make potentially possible uh, farm gate kind of analyses in a, in a different way. We Sarah still have, Lynn? yes? Sorry, just a question came up in the chat. Yes. Um, just are you talking about GMO hops? And I think you're actually talking about diagnostics, but I just thought I'd let you clarify there. Yes, I'm talking about diagnostics um, because this system, this CRISPR-Cas13 system is used for gene editing because the system knows how to find particular uh, viruses and genetic patterns that can be exploited for gene editing. But its ability to find viruses which is its original function, is also great for diagnostics. And so you're right to think CRISPR uh, CAS systems are being used for gene editing, but it's being used differently now for developing a diagnostic. And so when it was used, it wouldn't create any kind of genetic modification, but it will make a color go off if they actually detect the virus. And then you will be able to see that color accumulating in your solution perhaps with a tool that you can just clip on your cell phone. So that's a ways out yet, but this technology is moving faster than you would imagine. And so I am hopeful that we are going to have some really helpful breakthroughs in quicker diagnostics for a variety of viruses. You know, it's probably going to be next five to 10 years, but maybe it'll be faster. It'd be awesome. Thank you for the question. At our end here at MSU, what we were tasked to do was to make some better, quicker approaches for diagnosing infections in Michigan plants because it was getting costly to send them out of state and taking a long time for people. And so we've been funded to look through some of the current systems that are available to evaluate them and to um, basically develop our own methods that would, would be appropriate for our system. So part of what we determined in going through and testing things is that many of the published protocols were not always effective. And part of that is simply because we are only now really starting to get enough sequences of hot viruses out there to make sure that we know what targets we're looking for. So some of the earlier protocols were limited in the data they had, and so they made their best guess, but it may not have been the best match to all the viruses out there. So at this point in our lab, we have completed um, RT-PCR design, so molecular diagnostics for the three Carla viruses and the apple mosaic virus. And we are in the testing stage, finalizing some work for um, Arabis mosaic virus and the two um, vibroids. And so we will release these to our uh, partner MSU Diagnostics Lab here in the US as well as the Michigan Department 
uh, agricultural rural development so that they can be used uh, for more effective and, and cheaper testing. They also will be publicly available, so not proprietary. So anyone who wanted to use these on their own or to take them to another lab could do that. At the same time, um, we've been continuing our work with deep sequencing the Michigan samples. So we sampled um, from hop yards throughout the lower peninsula of Michigan and took plants both with and without symptoms. And then we bulked up these plants samples together in groups and then did the deep sequencing on them. And uh, we continue, we've been working with this data now for about a year, looking at it in more detail. We still see for, in our patterns there that the, the two hop latent viruses are really abundant here in Michigan. Um, the hop mosaic virus and the apple mosaic virus are well distributed but less prevalent. We haven't found any of the Erebus mosaic virus yet and we haven't found any serious novel viruses yet, but we're still doing some final checks on this. And so one of the points I wanted to emphasize is when we're thinking about viruses, sequencing them is so powerful because it helps us understand when we have variants. So we know right now with SARS-CoV-2 that we're worried about this variants coming from the UK and other variants that have been noted in South Africa and Brazil, for example. So here in Michigan, for example, the uh, UK variant just showed up and Washtenaw County because someone from the University of Michigan um, brought it over here from uh, England or the, the UK. And as a result, the health county is was doing genomic surveillance, saw this, jumped on it right away. So now the University of Michigan is being asked to shut down its entire athletic program for several weeks to try to constrain this particular variant because it is it's so much more infectious, more transmissible. So when we think about plants, it's kind of similar. If we know we have a particular species of virus, that's really helpful, but it can be even more helpful when we know uh, more detail. What variant do we have? And so I showed some of you this figure earlier, but it's an important point here. If we look at the hop latent virus family, for example, based upon some of the coprotein sequences, you can see there's sort of three big groups of it here. So we're looking at a tree. Uh, these lines show how they're connected to each other. So the farther apart things are, um, the less related they are. So here is a group, for example, they're clustered together. This is an Asian group. There's a European group over here, which includes what hop from Michigan that we found. And then there's more of a North American group, which includes hop from Washington state and hop from Michigan. So this is very important for us in Michigan because it helps us see that we're getting virus pressure from two directions. We have a both North American pressure in here as well as some from Europe. And that's not surprising because we're kind of in a, a switching yards here where we have interactions both directions. But, but as we move forward and we try to understand what do we need to be concerned about, what's important for impact, it may be really important for us to know, do we have this version of HPLV? Or do we have this version? Do they have equal impacts or are they different? So this question of the extent of, of infection in hop is important. And as you probably know, hop is frequently is infected. So some of the data um, from Melanie, for example, here in this nice study where they sampled plants in these different regions in Ontario found there's a considerable amount of virus infection throughout here, um, both the, uh, I'm sorry, I got a phone beeping at me, I'm gonna turn off here. Um, both two of the Carla viruses, as well as some of the apple mosaic virus. And if we uh, look at more detail, we can see the apple mosaic virus had lower incidence, but it was still very high in some yards. Similarly, if we look at the hop stunt viroid, Melanie's data is over here on the left, and we can see that the infection here was very high in this one particular yard, but 
but uh, other places much lower. And what I want to compare that to over here is here is a similar analysis in the hot growing regions in Washington state, where I looked at three different regions and here are the rates of positives. Mm -hmm. So for this particular infection, actually um, the Ontario study here shows overall lower rates uh, comparable to lower than in Washington state. So I, I want to point this out, not because it's anything um, particularly magic or fixed because these numbers keep changing, but rather it's easy for us to imagine that wherever we are, when we turn up numbers like this, that our particular part of the world is having a particular problem. And sometimes that can be true. But I want to emphasize that for hop, these infections are just very widespread. So it is an industry-wide problem, not an Ontario problem, not a Michigan problem. It is an industry-wide problem. And more than that, I want to give you some bigger context here to help emphasize the point that virus and viroid infections in general are widespread. So when we're thinking about hop, it's not like hop tends to get infected and everything else is clean. Pretty much any aspect of the horticultural industry right now is struggling with these questions. And we see that viruses are widespread in nature too. So I want to show you some of the data from the basic science world about this to give you a flavor of how integral viruses and viroids are to nature. It's gonna make us think a little differently about how we're managing them, eradicating may not be 100% possible unless we really modify the genetic material of our plants. So I wanna show you uh, two studies done to the basic science world, understanding how viruses are distributed across what we call agroecological interfaces. So looking at areas where there's uh, both wild plants and influence of agriculture. So this is a study led by uh, French researchers here that looked at two Mediterranean climate areas, the south of France here, and then the western part of South Africa. And these were enormous studies where they put big grids to sample. These are almost five kilometers on a side in each of these two locations where they would go from a wild area over into a cropping area. And so the idea is to sample vegetation across these wide areas to better understand how viruses are distributed and how uh, common they are. So to give you a flavor for it, this is what it looks like in the French side. The crops here are rice grown here, winter wheat and alfalfa. There's low grazing, low intensity grazing areas. These are the famous Camargue horses and then these seasonal marshes. So this is a gradient here of land use from more wild to more cultivated. And likewise, we can see in South Africa that there is some really gorgeous native vegetation, these types like this, native herbivores grazing it. And then right next to it, right abutting it, can be these uh, intense agricultural growing areas. So again, you can have really strong contrasts and in this study, the researchers took vegetation in these circles, wherever the GPS unit said their point was, they take, all, they take the critical vegetation types in each of these big circles and then go through a lot of technical stuff and sequence them. And the net result of that is this figure here, which shows the prevalence of viruses in South Africa and then France in two different years. So this is the virus prevalence over here and what I want to show you is whether or not we look at cultivated plants in blue or uncultivated ones, the incidence of infection is really high. So for example, in South Africa, it's about 50% uh, of the samples in cultivated plants were infected and a good 20% in the uncultivated ones. You can see here in France, for example, these numbers were both over 30% for both types of plants. And these two things are breakdowns for viruses that we know just inf infect plants and those that infect fungi that infect plants. So this is some of the data that this kind of deep sequencing is, is helping us to see that virus infection is just widespread part of nature. 
and we find novel virus groups. This study found 94 novel virus groups, primarily in the non-cultivated, the wild plants. So when we're thinking about viruses and how to control them, we have to have to keep in mind that they are everywhere and they're just part of nature. Here's another way of looking at it. This is a study with a colleague at UC Riverside looking at viruses and wild cucurbita. So you may know that the melons are grown here in Southern California. And this LA basin is also a huge urban center with 19 million people in it. So it's a dry environment, has these very abrupt interfaces between agriculture and urban areas. In this study, they wanted to take a look at the virus load in some native adapted perennials. So they're looking at two cucurbita here and a datura, which grow in the wild areas that are left in this region. And one of the things that's so interesting about these plants is that they remain green even into the summer drought in Southern California when it's very dry in the summer. These wild perennial plants are still very green. That makes them very attractive to insects. And so the Aphis gossypii, for example, which is a global crop pest, will migrate from crop fields nearby into these wild plant systems where it can damage the plants. You can see this incredible a number of them feeding on this wild plant here. And they also can transmit viruses. So just visually, you can get a look at this. They looked at three different populations. These are plant populations coded by their color in a reserve area here and um, extending on either side. And you can see this sharp abutment with agriculture and, uh, and industry Sorry, this is urban and industry and agriculture over here. So these land uses are right close up to each other and insects can move viruses back and forth. Likewise, in this reserve here, you can see the distinct land use changes right up against each other. So what I just wanna show you from this, you just get a flavor of this, is that almost all of these wild plants had some type of crop virus. Down here is a list of crop viruses, and here are the ones that have no crop virus. This is the proportion that had something, and the colors are the three different plants. So basically over here you can see for the orange plant, only 15% of the plants did not have a virus. So 85% of them had something, had some type of crop virus. So virus infections are moving between crops and wild plants, and some of the crops are, are potentially putting a fair amount of pressure on wild plants with the virus transmission. And we can look at those and networking patterns. This is the type of thing that's happening in, in virus ecology now. What this network shows is that these are the different plant populations in the squares and circles, and these triangles are the different uh, types of viruses. And when they're in the center here, they're more connected. So we can see that these populations are connected through um, virus patterns, including this primary crop virus here. So part of this, what this type of study reveals is that crop viruses are ubiquitous, both in crops and non-crop plants, but there's also what we call wild or non-crop viruses that we're trying to understand. And this is an example. Here are uh, four different viruses in this group we call the Partiti viridi. And again, we're looking at the three different plant types in these different colors. And you can see only a tiny fraction of the plants did not have one or another of these, sometimes multiple of them. So this is to emphasize for us that we have a lot of crop viruses out there, but we also have these non-crop viruses that have not showed up before as pathogens. And they have potential to be doing things that range from neutral to beneficial as well. So the key question we're all looking at right now is, do infections matter and which ones? And this is critical. If we can't always get viruses out of our hops, once we have an infection in the hop, we, there's nothing we can do to remove the infection. Our only choice is to get rid of the plant. That gets really expensive. So a question for us is, does it matter? When do we need to be worried? When do we need to rogue our hop yards? So the answer to this question is gonna be highly dependent on this sort of genes time environment interaction, the genes of the plant, the genes of the virus and the environment that it's growing in. 
So if you look at the literature, there are really variable results. Infection with pathogenic type viruses can reduce cone yield, can reduce alpha acids, but not always. Sometimes it potentially takes it the other direction. We can see that these effects are varying by the pathogen species and strain, the cultivar, the plant age, and the environment. So that genes times environment pattern. And what I want to show you here is an example with a hop stunt viroid in uh, Washington State looking at the percentage infection by cultivar. And you can see that one of the first steps is just simply how susceptible are different cultivars? How much pressure are they getting? So these three cultivars here, Cascade, Galena, and Glacier, both had considerably higher levels of hop stunt viroids than the others. So one issue for us is how, how susceptible individual cultivars are. And then the next question is, what happens to our product? Are we going to have decent cone yield? Are we going to have decent quality? And so this is the last bit I'm going to show you here is a series of uh, figures from a study that Petheridge et al. did in Tasmania in 2002, just to illustrate this, to help us think about what's going on. So here, for example, is uh, they grew the nugget cultivar from the US, and they're looking at the cone yield. So they were doing it as kilograms of green weight per string. And here's with different infections, hot mosaic virus, hot latent virus, apple mosaic virus, and hop latent virus and apple mosaic virus together, and then virus free. So this is kind of our control on the far right here. And they looked at them for two years, 1999 and 2000. And there's no letters on here, no statistical markings, because there wasn't any significant effect in this cultivar on cone yield of any of these infections. So even though these numbers go up and down a little bit, they're statistically all the same in a given year. What we can see is that 1999 was a much better year than 2000. And so in this case, the difference between years was had a bigger impact on yield than whether or not these hop were infected. So that helps put it in some context. And it, one thing that's interesting to see is that in the virus-free plant, it went from a really high point here to a considerably lower point in the second year. And just compare over here, hop latent virus, it wasn't such a great performer. Again, these are all statistically insignificant, but if you look at the mean value of it, it was a tad lower, but it didn't really respond very much to the poorer conditions in the next year. So this is something that's really interesting for us to think about in terms of the research, because people are thinking that there are circumstances in which virus infection may help stress tolerance of plants. And so it's an interesting question for us to explore. Uh, is the hop latent virus actually contributing something beneficial here or not? We don't know, but it's worth figuring out. Now here is a comparison is opal, a German cultivar, and in this one, you can see I put some letters here. So that means with this lowercase a here in 1999, that means this hop latent virus cone yield was less than the rest. And in, and in 2000, these two A's mean that the hop mosaic virus and the hop latent virus had reduced cone yield. So we can see that this really varies with the cultivar. Nugget did not have any cone yield loss to infections, but opal had some and to these two viruses. And now if we look at uh, one measure of quality, uh, I'm just showing the alpha acid results here, but they also looked at beta acids, for example. And so this is to look at um, how much yields were reduced in a particular year. And you can see here, that in 2000, the blue year, there were no differences in the alpha acid percentages. But in the second year, the red one here, the apple mosaic virus brought down that quality a bit. And if we look at the opal, so as before, same kind of comparison here, you can see the quality really varied with the year. 2000 was a better year, but 
there's no statistical differences on this. So none of the viruses actually impacted the quality. So what we saw is that the yield of nugget, we go back here, the yield of nugget was not impacted by infection, but its quality was a little bit. And in contrast, opal had some quality, had some yield losses, but no quality hits. So there's quite a bit of variability there. And if you look at the actual mean numbers, these are not statistically different, but notice that the percentages here, here's our virus-free control, three of these infected treatments actually had uh, their mean values was greater. So when we think about where we're going with working with viruses and viroids in the hop industry, I just want to share a little bit of my thoughts about where the future can bring. One is this absolute requirement for improved testing, which I know you all are enthusiastic about. And that leads us to the next critical component of genomic surveillance. So by sequencing viruses and understanding uh, their relationship to crop performance, we can evaluate them and get a better sense of when we should be concerned. So if I have a hop yard and I have 100% infection, I'm going to want to know, is this a variant that matters? Or is this like the common cold and I can get some more yield from this before I decide to take it out? So this is a critical area for all of plant pathology now is genomic surveillance. So we can really identify which variants are where and which ones are concerning. And it also can be used for accountability, for tracking, to understand where viruses are coming from. Is looking at those family relationships, we can tell if a virus has come from abroad, the virus has come from a different state, and that can really help us understand how to control things. Another part to this that I think is going to be critical is more grower data collection that can be employed for a precision agriculture type approach. And so here in Michigan, uh, I've been working with Aaron Lazat and Rob Serene, and we've been thinking a lot about how to facilitate this. And uh, you'll probably hear some more from us about that in the future. We would like to develop means by which it's easier for growers to collect data about management yield and quality that can be related to infection status that will allow us to do kind of more of that big data analysis that facilitates a precision ag approach. And by that we mean being able to say again from your system with what infections you have, what are the best options for management? When should you pull plants out? When should you fertilize more, etc. And so I think this type of approach is part of where the future is headed and thinking about how to develop systems for this that respect people's privacy and yet are still uh, powerful will be a, a really fun challenge going forward. And then the final component, which I haven't put up here, is ultimately if, if viruses are concerning and, and cannot be eliminated, there will be the question of do we modify our plant material? Do we do gene editing on it? Do we make GMOs or not? And that's, a, that's an open question for everybody. So I hope this overview gives you some more context to think about the decision-making directions for the industry as a whole. And I'd be happy to uh, talk with you more or answer any particular questions that have come up. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn, that was, that was great. Um, so for our audience, we've got uh, some time left for questions. So you are welcome to uh, pop your questions either into the chat and I can read them for you or um, ask them yourself. Uh, maybe while we wait for people to think about questions, Carolyn, I'll ask you a question. Um, so with regards to uh, what you've been finding, so we do talk about, we always encourage growers to source clean plants if they can. Um, that's not necessarily easy though, especially for our growers uh, in, in Ontario, it's, it's hard to get some of these clean plants across the border. 
Um, do you think though, given that you're seeing sometimes there isn't an impact on virus, how important is it that to start with clean plants? I think if you have a choice, whenever possible, go for clean because some of these infections do have negative impacts. And right now we aren't able to sort them out specifically for a particular hop yard and say yay or nay for a particular variant. That's a future, that's a future direction. So I, if it were me, I would do my best to get clean plants that I could. Thanks, Carolyn. That's sort of what I thought as well. Um, and also the, uh, just because we don't have any other questions, please do feel free to, to type in some questions in the chat. But while we wait again, um, what you were seeing with the impacts of the viruses, not necessarily impacting yield. Now those were all the hop viruses. Would you expect something similar with viroids, which can be more severe in hops? Or has there um, been any tests done with, with viroids and their impacts on yield and quality? Yeah, I, I, we just don't have as much of a handle on that yet. Um, viroids are, people are still, we're still working on it conceptually. So I don't have an answer for you on that one, whether or not there can be positive things or if viroids are, are always concerning. Thanks, Carolyn. Is there anyone there who has some questions for Carolyn other than other than me? Yeah, I have a question, Carolyn. So, yeah, so it's uh, me. My name is uh, Gautam Das. I'm from Lakehead University and is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And uh, so, it's a wonderful presentation. I like that. So, because uh, the reason I came here to understand. Uh, some of the process because by training, I'm a physicist, uh, an optical physicist. So what we are doing, we are trying to develop detections tool. Uh, one of the target is to detect uh, different acids like alpha, beta acids in hops. So we planted some plants. Now, when you did mention about uh, detecting virus, now I have a question for you. Is anyone tried with uh, Raman spectroscopy to uh, study the virus, uh, the presence of virus or, or, or on the plan. You mean like using a remote sensing approach? Uh, no, it's called Raman spectroscopy. Like, okay, I, I, you have to tell me what it is. Oh, okay, so, so what Raman spectroscopy, like infrared spectroscopy, FTIR, so uh, like Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Sure. So what happened here, you allow light to interact with the material and then you get some signal, which are related to uh, suppose uh, that uh, you are talking about say RNA uh, or right. So at present, actually, I can uh, I can tell you uh, we are working with uh, detection of proteins using uh, Raman spectroscopy. So we develop some nano sensor. Uh, we are not successful yet. One of the target is to detect COVID nineteen. So, but we are not there. So number of uh, uh, industry are uh, involved. So when you said the virus detection, I think, uh, so that's the question, whether anyone tried with that. When you said that there are many instruments coming in medical area, which can be used. So I believe that uh, Raman spectroscopy is, uh, it will be one of the option. Uh, it's, it's just a name Raman, R-A-M-A-N, Raman spectroscopy. So he was a physicist. He received Nobel Prize for uh, this special kind of spectroscopy. So what it does, it gives a special signature, a unique signature for any chemical you can imagine. So we, we use FTICRMS for looking at compounds coming out of plant roots. For example, if we want We've been studying how do virus infections infect, alter roots, which is really important for stress and what things come out of the roots. And the FDICR MS is really powerful, but it's also it's also challenging. And I, I don't know the details. I think it's awesome that you're pursuing something like this. If I had to put money down right now, I would put money on the CRISPR-Cas system that's coming out because it really is good at finding specific viruses really well. 
and it's based on some biology for that that has evolved over you know billions of years yeah regarding that uh, because i have uh, colleagues uh, they are from uh, in canada we call prince edward island so pei one of my colleagues, uh, they are working with hops actually they are doing using ramen uh, in real time to find out all the different uh, alpha and beta acids. So anyway, may I have your email address. Maybe I'll share with you some of our information. Absolutely, that'd be great. I can absolutely see using it for the alpha and beta acids. Absolutely. I'm not so sure about the viruses, but it'd be awesome to see. Yeah, so that's the, so I'll, I'll share with you and send you an email. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question and the information. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else have questions for Carolyn? Well, thank you all for connecting. And if you have questions later that you'd like to email me, my email is here down below. Feel free, or you can look me up on the web or ask Melanie uh, um, how, to, how to reach me. And I look forward to meeting everybody again in person when we are in the after times and get through this crazy pandemic. In the meanwhile, I wish everyone the very best with their hop and everything else. Well, thank you, Carolyn, again, for agreeing to speak to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And yes, um, I would encourage uh, all of you, if you do have follow-up questions for Carolyn, to, uh, to either reach out to her directly or through me. We uh, will hopefully be posting a recording of this webinar onto the blog uh, in the future. Um, and uh, that is, our, I guess, our second guest speaker on Happenings webinar. Um, we will be looking at scheduling uh, another one, probably uh, at the end of March, early April. So uh, just uh, look to the blog for, um, for the dates. And with that, thanks, Carolyn. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everybody. Take thank care. you very much, Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks.